Okay, this is just linear algebra review. Uh, it's mostly there for you to, to, to look at it uh, yourself. Uh, the reason I'm introducing this is so that we look at, uh, just remind ourselves of linear algebra uh, using this Brees uh, library in Scala. So this is what this other NLP library later on, overload zone and also N uh, Sparks MLlib. So yeah, basically with matrices, vectors, arithmetic operations, of matrices and vectors. Uh, you import it and you, know, you can create a matrix, uh, element access and so on, right? So you can you can either have a dense matrix, I won't evaluate all this, yeah, dense matrix, you can ask for the size, rows, um, columns and access elements. And uh, yeah, there are some, some gotchas because uh, matrices start at zero. So I sort of compare with NumPy and MATLAB all the time and there's some cheat sheet that tells you the three syntax. I'm so sorry, but, but yeah, sometimes you need to be in one system, sometimes in the other system, right? Um, and that's yeah, your basic vector. And you can again have a dense vector, uh, specified type. Uh, you can get zeros, you have transpose. Uh, what else? You can do addition and subtraction of matrices. Um, and then this is kind of a nice cheat sheet. Element-wise addition in Brees or Scala Brees is like this, MATLAB, NumPy. Right? So element-wise multiplication is slightly different. It's about star for MATLAB as well. Okay, element-wise comparison, so on. And then scalar multiplication, dot product and matrix vector multiplication. So there's some super rusty, you can look at some, some animations of what are eigenvectors and eigenvalues and, you know, just, yeah, I expect you're sort of familiar with like what happens geometrically when we do linear algebraic operations, right? Uh, at least in two, three dimensions, you should know. Uh, dot products, um, yeah, we do this element by multiplication, matrix vector multiplication. So, and, and you need to think about complexity in sort of the single machine case, right? So for matrix vector multiplication, for vector vector multiplication dot product, how many operations do you do? One by N, it's just N operation, right? So N multiplications. And uh, if it's a matrix and you do a matrix vector operation, then how many arithmetic operations do you do for multiplying a matrix by a vector? Yeah, I mean, you can think of the columns of the matrix. Yeah, n. I mean, n by. So it's n by n matrix, and then you just yeah, you have to multiply uh, for every every column um, um, once, right? So you have to do n uh, n square multiplications. Uh, so what else? Uh, matrix matrix multiplication. So if you do this naively. What happens? Yeah, exactly. If you do it naively, it's basically n squared times n right, for each column. So they call them dense just because they're like not sparse. Yeah, yeah. Dense means yeah, every every indexed element has a value. So it could be zero. Like matrix, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's because we can also uh, have sparse matrices, and so that's a more efficient encoding which only talks about non-zero elements, right? Um, yeah, so you have identity matrix. Inverses, so, so there are, uh, let's see, I mean, uh, yeah, how much time there is left, but yeah, there are um, uh, specialized uh, efficient algorithms that do better than N cube, the multiplications and so on. But for us, our main focus is uh, yeah, so we, we, we understand the complexity, uh, time complexity of uh, these sort of small matrix operations. Small means it fits in a machine basically, but then we are mainly focused on what happens when the matrix really gets too big, uh, the vector gets too big or yeah, various combinations, right? That's the distributed linear algebra part that's coming up. Okay, so you have norms and uh, so on. So this is mostly just, uh, um, yeah, this is just this cheat sheet I sort of pasted it here, okay? So, yeah, I don't know. 
if you are not familiar with big O notation, big omega, big theta, look at the Khan Academy video. Um, okay. So here uh, we're going to do uh, linear regression a bit uh, uh, slower. So this is just linear regression. You can watch this uh, now if you forgot linear regression by Hasty and Tipshrani. It's from this uh, playlist. So this is, uh, this is quite good, 15 hours of machine learning basically. Um, yeah, and then there are various uh, uh, methods, uh, um, you know, so regression, reg which regression is uh, one of them. Um, and if you want to dive into a bit more details, uh, Murphy's machine learning book is the place to go. Okay. okay. So we have basically uh, A, which is a, a matrix with uh, M rows and D columns. Uh, so it's an element of R M cross D. Um, and so when you do your last module, right, you, you may want to mix LaTeX like this uh, with, uh, with Markdown, because that would be nice. And yeah, you, you can kind of figure it out. You sometimes have to escape like this. If you use this LaTeX notation, you have to do another backspace because Databricks is parsing this a bit. Yeah. Um, okay, so what we are going to do, so you know gradient descent. So gradient uh, is just a generalization of a slope and you have some kind of objective function and then you're trying to minimize it. And uh, you know, wherever you are, you look at the gradient and you follow, uh, yeah, follow the path of the, uh, um, you know, where, where the gradient is going down up to some, some uh, factor, right? So this is called the learning rate. And all you're doing is local optimization, right? So this is basically one of the main missionaries uh, we use in, in machine learning to learn. Okay, so here, um, this is a blog, I think I, um, sort of went through this at some point and uh, tried to put it in, 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 in the notebook, right? So let's, uh, so I think what we will be doing here is simulate some, some, some data that we kind of understand, very simple uh, plane, some Gaussian noise. And then we'll take the simulated data and then try to actually reconstruct the, the, the intercept and the slope terms, right? But then we, instead of using the ML pipeline, we will do things kind of low level, like how do you use broadcast variables uh, to sort of share the gradient across a possibly large data set. So that's the main goal here. So it's like a RDD level. Okay, so let's try this. Um, I'm gonna... So we import uh, breeze stats distributions, start everything and then uh, so X is uh, um, uh, defined like this as a Gaussian uh, with the center one and variance two. And then I'm sampling just 10,000 points, okay? So, um, so this is done like lazily, right, with def. And then when I do XRDD equals SC dot parallelize of X, it will just sort of have all these things for us lazily. Right, and then you can look at uh, what is the the mean and the sample variance, right? So that should be mean should be one, and the sample variance is the square of the standard deviations, which we close to four from our sample. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to have another immutable x like stats uh, where I have xrdd stats mean sample variance and sum and right so this is just uh, to show you you can sort of directly get at some of these uh, statistics okay so now uh, let's let's cook up our little data set simulated so uh, x is uh, what we just simulated so it's you can think of this x1 right so now I'm going to define another uh, um, immutable x2 as Gaussian centered at zero with variance one. Okay, and I'm sampling it 10,000 times. Um, and then I'm going to uh, take x, which I had earlier, right? 
this guy. Uh, and then I'm going to zip with X2. So it's going to create these two tuples, right? So 10,000 of them. And then I have, um, yeah, I'm going to take this zip thing and then map uh, every element in XX into this two times the first point, right? Because XS, XX is now every value is P. So it's the first uh, element in the tuple plus one times the second element in the tuple plus 1.5. So this is sort of my, my, my two slopes and my intercept, right? So I have, yeah, I have points X1, X2, Gaussian distributed, and then I'm basically uh, creating my, um, my sort of uh, Y value, right? So this is my uh, labeled point. Okay, so then I um, add some noise to this. Uh, so Gaussian zero one and standard normal letters. And finally I'm taking Y and then I'm taking LP, right? The sort of deterministic points on the plane. Uh, and then I add the noise, I mean, I zip, zip it with the noise and then I map, yeah. I add the noise to the, you know, to the points on the, on the plane, right? So that's what this does. And then now I'm gonna call yx as y zipped with xx. And, uh, and then I'm gonna map every point in, in the zipping now, right? So we have y with the Gaussian noise and my xx, which is downstairs. And then I simply turn them into uh, three points, right? So this is the y value, p first one will be y, and then this is x1 and x2. There you go. So it's kind of a baby 2D regression. Completely cooked up. Right? Um, good. So now what are we going to do? Um, We're going to take this, uh, this data set. Um, so this is um, yx, and then I'm going to turn it into a RDD. Right? And if I take five, I can see it will be a parallel collections RDD and it will have a Y value, X1 value and X2 value, right? 10,000 of them. Okay. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna turn this to a data frame and Y, X1, X2. So now it's, oops, yeah, there we go. All right. So now the question is how do we, uh, if this is our given data, somebody gave this to us, then uh, we want to invert this and do inference, right? So we're trying to identify the intercept and so forth. But um, yeah, so first let's use the ML pipeline. So we can just, uh, yeah, do ML regression, linear regression, and yeah, set this up. Um, you can say, um, Yeah, so these are these are sort of the, the various uh, parameters um, for the linear regression model, right? Okay. And then now I'm gonna transform data frame to the sort of required format. So I map uh, each row because RDD's rows and I'm getting the double first one and then remember, I need to make this a vector. My features need to be a vector. So it's all sort of slightly low level rolling, okay? Uh, get double one, get double two, and then I'm gonna call this label and features. So it looks, it looks very similar. I'm not using the vectorizer and all the fancy transformers like we did last time, right? So just to, okay. So then uh, I'm using the, the pipeline now and just call the fit method on this uh, um, um, estimator. And I'm gonna get uh, this, uh, you know, this, this model called fit and it will have an intercept term, which we are checking for sanity. Remember the, the, the intercept was 1.5, right? We, we coded intercept as 1.5. So well, it seems to be working. 
And then this should be two and one, right? So what are the coefficients? So we did make it to be two and one. So it's, it's, it's close, you know, maybe central limit theorem or so that's, uh, and then you can do summary. So this is slightly uh, low level, but we're still dropping into the, into the, uh, into the data frame land and using the uh, ML library. So you can look at uh, R square. So that's a pretty good fit, which means square error. And so this is sort of basically sanity check. Okay, understanding that when we actually simulate the data, does it produce something? You know. So okay. Um, so now, um, yeah. So these are p values and t values and so on for regression. So let's not get too. Um, so now I can um, I can you know. Basically, once I fit it, it's a transformer, so I can feed it the, 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 the features and it will do my predictions, right? So this is the label that we learned from and the prediction, it's kind of close, yeah. Okay, at least, yeah, it's somewhat close. And you can look at the residuals and so on. So you can, do, you can, you can plot those and do the usual regression thing, see the residuals are sort of normally distributed and so on. So, now, what I wanted to do is uh, this exercise. So we are going to write our own Spark program for the least square fit, okay? So this is like your hello world of like optimization in Spark. Okay, so, uh, um, so there is a little bit of uh, syntactic help. Uh, and then the idea is to write your own linear regression function using reduce and broadcast operations, right? So you're not going to call the fit method. You're going to actually think about it in a bit more primitive way. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, so what do we want? We want to find W1 and W2 such that, you know, the label minus the W1 of X1, W2 of X2 phi, the whole squared is minimized because we're using L2 loss, okay? Um, okay, so then uh, the question is how do we analyze this? Um, how do we actually do the optimization? Um, so, the, the, so we have to think about uh, communications, right? So how are we going to, so somehow let's say uh, the current value of the gradient is something, right? And then you want to somehow uh, update this, this value of the gradient uh, and, then, uh, and then communicate that to, uh, uh, you know, to all the elements. And so then when they have done, you know, um, learned, then you have to basically communicate it back. So there are these communication patterns. Uh, um, so all to all, one to all, and all to one. So this is basically all to all is every, Every, every uh, executor is basically communicating to every other executor, right? About the current value, the gradient, let's say. Um, one to all is say usually from, from the, uh, say the, say the driver program, you communicate it to all of the um, executors. And all to one is the other pattern where you communicate from all of the executors back to the driver, right? So these are the basic patterns. And then depending on the network, I mean, how, because we haven't really said a lot of details about how the, you know, how the, the, the nodes, the compute nodes are actually on a physical network, right? right? You can have like compute nodes, like on a ring, you can have them in, you know, in different architectures. You can, they can communicate with every other node or whatever you do. So there are certain communication things we need to be aware of. Um, so these are all in the, in the sort of Stanford lecture notes. We, we could maybe point out where to look at, but let's just start with uh, a simple example. So we have RDD uh, LR. So this is 10,000 and then we take 10 and then we see uh, this is our basic data. And uh, it's the same thing. So uh, now let's look at how many partitions there are. So in my case, there is two. So I could repartition it if I want. Um, in the community edition, you probably have eight by default, I think. Okay. So now, um, 
yeah, I'm sort of writing this explicitly. Y x one x two is basically the second element, the first element, the third element, and then the first element. So I'm sort of changing the order and taking ten. Okay, so uh, so now what we're going to do is import Brees linear algebra dense vector, and then um, I'm going to map um, map this y x one x two to uh, uh, basically x one x two and then y, and then I'm going to cache this. Okay. Uh, so then. Um, all we need to do is a one to all and all to one broadcast of the gradient. This is a pattern we are choosing to use, okay? So initially the, the, the vector is zero, 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 right? And then I'm gonna have my broadcast variable, right? So this is from day one or something, um, right? This is our primitive to, to do this type of communication. So now uh, W underscore BC is the sort of weights is available as a broadcast variable in each of the executors, remember? So we do this, and then we say step is zero one and maximum number of iterations is 100, right? These are what's called a learning rate or something. Okay, so then, so um, I don't know, I might have fixed this already. So you're, this was kind of an exercise. So, so the idea is to fix this expression for grad w, w0, grad w1, and grad w2 to have um, um, the broadcast value to be the same as that from the ML libs fit coefficient. So that's the stuff we got from calling ML lib, right? So let's, um, let's see. Uh, so this is the basic pattern. Okay, so we have a for loop uh, and then we go through the max iterations and then we have a gradient W0, W1 and W2. So this will come from actually, um, you know, doing the update of the gradient, right? So for each point x, you know, um, we want to basically map. Uh, so remember, we defined PTS here, right? So it's uh, it's in this form, right? So x1, x2, and and y. So we're trying to, um, yeah. Uh, so whatever the broadcast uh, weight value is, uh, we take this, multiply it by one, and, uh, and then we take the, uh, the next element and multiply it by x zero, and then the next element and multiply it by x one, and we subtract x two and multiply it by one, and then we call reduce. So this is the, sort of atomic operation you're doing, right, on, on each point. And then finally, when you've done these, uh, this sort of reduce step, uh, you can have the, uh, the, the values updated with the, what's called the learning rate and then the gradient, right? You should recognize this. So uh, I don't know, I, I don't know if uh, I fixed this myself or so maybe it's not an exercise anymore. Um, so let's see. So I'm doing hundred iterations. So it's sort of going through uh, the, the PTS points RDD and then doing these, these maps, right? Um, I don't know, let's see. Um, oh, right, so I think, oh yes. Um, so fit.intercept is supposed to be 1.5 and fit.coefficients is supposed to be two and one. And we should be able to compute each of the gradients uh, and yes, so this is an exercise. So you have to actually, um, yes, you have to, yeah, you have to fix the expressions so that the, the, the broadcast variable for the weight 
uh, is the same as that from the ML libs fit coefficients. Okay, so we want to uh, we want to modify this. Okay, so maybe this will be the the first exercise. Okay. Um, because all you have to do is uh, communicate the updated gradients uh, and keep updating them. Okay. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, so let's say that's uh, assignment three, problem one. Okay, I'll maybe try to structure it a little bit more. So, uh, some string, string replacement. Um, okay, so here is a, a more detailed deep dive for, um, I mean, my point with that is, it's uh, you have to think a bit more carefully about how uh, how the communication pattern happens, how uh, the gradient is broadcasted, and and also the other thing to bear in mind is now the RDD is so small, so we're looping through every we're mapping every element right in iterations, and you can't do that when the data set is too large. Then you move into this other realm called stochastic gradient descent, right? where you would only loop through the uh, batches and, and then we have these epochs and so on. So that's kind of one way to handle uh, uh, a large amount of data. Right? And under some regularity conditions, stochastic gradient descent uh, can um, converge to the, to, the, to, the, to the solution of the actual gradient descent. So uh, let me point out here, So this is the, the, the notes. I sort of uh, haven't updated in a couple of years, but I looked at uh, Reza's current course. He's using the notes from like 2018 or something. I mean, it's so, it, yeah, um, it's basically the same. Um, so I will most likely cover this. So maybe you can read these 18 pages. Uh, yeah, I might just do something on the blackboard very quickly. Um, it, it talks about uh, yeah sequential random access machine, parallel random access machine. Uh, the main the main idea is called the work depth model, and um, and there is some simple uh, theorem due to Brent, and then it starts with uh, how to do summation in parallel. So if you have to sum eight hundred billion points, how can you do this right using yeah, so I think uh, some of these things, yeah, so if you wanna get into understanding matrix multiplication a bit more carefully, this will be the Strassen's algorithm, um, yeah, you, can, you can get into this. Uh, what else? Iterative solutions of solving systems of linear equations, constraint optimization, uh, okay. Yeah, so here is 67 on gradient descent, convergence of gradient descent. And, and uh, so I'm kind of, yeah, you can look at this. Yeah? Uh, and the broadcast and network and communication patterns. So, I mean, this is especially if you have a background in uh, algorithm analysis in the single machine, then uh, this is sort of the, the appropriate background material to dive into. Okay, this is what I'm talking about, one-to-all communication, all-to-all communication, and so on. Um, yeah, and, wow, uh, okay. So that exercise is basically implementing gradient descent in Spark 84, right? It seems like a lot, but I think you can sort of um, look at it, uh, yeah. All right, I, let's not, uh, uh, Let's not go too far down there. So I still want you to, um, to know 
uh, how to use uh, um, Spark uh, using the distributed linear algebra primitives that are in Spark, okay? So for this, uh, I mean, for, for, for you, for example, right, for your research problem, uh, spiky neural nets, whatever, I mean, if you use the Spark framework, which is pretty good, uh, I, I don't know, um, for, for a lot of low-level things, um, then this is the paper to, 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 to look at, matrix computations and optimizations in Apache Spark. So it's only eight pages. Uh, it's, it's quite, uh, you know, quite good to, to read this. So I think like in terms of preparing for the next sort of Blackboard lecture, I would read this paper because you know, you're spiking neural nets, you need to possibly operate from first principles, you know, like arithmetic. And what I wanted to mainly point out is that uh, there's not a lot you can do. So it talks about uh, spectral programs, SVDs, uh, convex programs, gradient descent, LBGF. This is the, yeah, a lot of the standard optimization methods. How do you do this in a distributed setting, right? So you have, uh, Oscar, you've taken optimization. No? I thought that's one of the required courses for data science. No? Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, without optimization, you can't do anything. I mean, you can't optimize, right? But I think you should be able to read this slowly, like, and, 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 and um, yeah, yeah. So, so what I wanted to do mainly is to get your hands kind of directly dirty on code cells. Uh, so you sort of know. So the main, main objects for distributed linear algebra are row matrix, index row matrix, coordinate matrix, block matrix, um, basically. And then you have local vectors and matrices that can be you know, kept in the driver uh, um, uh, locally. Right? And um, so, and then any of these things uh, you, you, you can, uh, you know, directly uh, look at the source code. So all of the MLlib uh, things you saw, right? There was some SVD and there was some uh, k-means, all sorts of things. Uh, basically for the optimization and linear algebra part, uh, this is the go-to paper, okay? And, and um, so yeah, so yeah, more on, so you say lasso regression with the L1 penalization, um, how this optimizer works. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, yeah. So a lot of the a lot of the uh, lower level things on 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 local computations use uh, sparse single core linear algebra uh, library. So this is like. Um, um, you know, Fortran code basically, okay? So I would read this and, um, and parts of this as much as you, as you want, okay? But mainly focus on, on 19 uh, for, the, for the homework problem. Uh, okay, so, So communication hierarchy is basically what we need to pay attention to because, uh, uh, you know, right, we have usual time complexity like number of operations and space complexity which is memory needs. But on top of it, we, we basically have to worry about how, uh, uh, how the communication costs are, are uh, you know, uh, scaling with the input size. So this is just you know, stuff going through. So say uh, uh, whatever that needs to go between the, the executors. So everything is basically focused on minimizing uh, computation, sorry, communication complexity because that has way slower than reading uh, reading from from memory, and, and which is a lot faster than reading from disk. Okay. So let's see, um, so just so, sort of summaries of the paper uh, and, and what I did here is mainly sort of march you through some of the, some of these um, data types. 
So in, in, uh, in Spark ML lib linear algebra, you have vector and vectors. So these are the things you would want to import. And then you can define a you know, dense vector like this and um, sparse vectors like this, right? So three, and these are the, the non-zero index elements and these are the non-zero elements. So everything else is, right? So we, um, so, um, and also there's sort of local vector in Python. This is something to, to, to bear in mind because later on we will drop into Python as well. Um, so just sort of go through this uh, mainly. So what is a label point, local matrix, distributed matrix. Uh, okay, let's look at distributed matrix. Um, so here, um, Uh, yeah, so this is uh, three types of distributed matrix. There's a row matrix. Uh, it's a row oriented distributed matrix. Um, and uh, it's basically a collection of feature vectors is a typical example. Uh, it's the, um, the Spark core backend is basically RDD of its rows where each row is a local vector. So local vector means it can be kept in the, in the memory of the executor. So this, uh, this, this automatically means the row can't be too big, right? Um, there's also um, index row matrix uh, where the rows are, uh, those have indices. Um, and this is if you want to identify the rows and, and do some joints uh, later on. And then the coordinate matrix is a distributed matrix stored in the coordinate list format. And uh, it's basically, the you know the ij entries of of the matrix, so this is kind of the the granddaddy thing, right? So you can have an arbitrary large matrix, and for every ij that's non zero, you can you can store it as a coordinate matrix, and they all have different uh, yeah the partition footprints. So um, I mean, so these things are mainly I think these are just sort of just Showing you how you how you create a, a, an RDD of um, of uh, you know a row matrix. So you can take new row matrix and give it a bunch of rows like this, so a vector dense or vector sparse, and, and sort of play around, right? Uh, so now I'm sort of suddenly saying, okay, we can do. Uh, so this is so the so-called tall and skinny matrix. So in the in this paper, you will see it's basically when you have the number of rows is really large. The number of columns is small, so it's called tall and skinny. So with tall and skinny, there's a lot of patterns you can exploit because, uh, because the yeah, size of the row is very small. Right? So um, this sort of tells you how to do QR decomposition for, uh, for a tall and skinny matrix, for example. Um, and sort of have some Python ones as well. So what I, would encourage you to do is to sort of read the paper. I would say it's worth spending like two hours or whatever, <laughs> and then kind of not be, yeah, and then see how the code works. Um, for just some, some simple made up ones, right? There's index row matrix and coordinate matrix and block matrix. Okay? So I, I won't go too much into it. I just wanted you to sort of help you take the sort of simple steps on distributed linear algebra. So we, um, most of you will not need to go there, right? Uh, unless you're doing something that is not part of the standard ML pipeline and very few things are not part of the pipeline, okay? Um, but, but sometimes you need to, yeah, go your own. Okay, so let's continue this. Uh, this is the ML plan pipeline. Oh no, we should stop, sorry. Um, yeah, I'll stop. Okay, so let's continue um, with uh, the machine learning library. So we mainly went through some of these uh, things uh, and the main assignment is to read this uh, paper. 
Uh, this is the third main paper about Spark. And, uh, and for the next lecture, I will, I will, I will cover chapter one and uh, in, in, in this um, distributed algorithms and optimization course. So have a look at this and then I'll try to move toward um, the, the optimization for gradient descent. Okay, so this is, uh, what is this? Here. Okay, so, so now what uh, I'm going to do is briefly mention, uh, so the power plant pipeline, uh, it's simply continuing now. And what I've done is mainly uh, call the rest of the ML pipeline and uh, you can go through this. Um, so it's, we're doing some tuning and evaluation and uh, um, yeah. Um, and then we, we don't do deployment yet. So deployment is when you've learned the model, you can actually have that uh, serve um, new uh, queries coming in. So prediction, but uh, I think you can go through this because it's, uh, it's uh, simply using more and more stages in your ML pipeline. Okay, so go through this on your own. And one thing I would like to point out, this is, uh, um, it's a very nice video, a little bit old, but it's quite good. It's, uh, it talks about activity recognition from accelerometer readings using uh, Spark SQL windows, which is something we haven't seen. And it does prediction using uh, random forests that are sort of, yeah, you basically have a window and you have uh, various measurements from accelerometer of a cell phone, like changes in X, Y, and Z at different time points for different users as they're doing different activities. Some are sitting, some are walking, running, jogging, whatever. And then the idea is to basically do classification to you know, activity recognition. What are they doing based on accelerometer measurements? And so you are trying to set up, uh, because it's a, it's a it's an activity in time, you're trying to somehow set up uh, some kind of a SQL window operation, and then you use random forests of SQL windows. So this again is a very uh, nice thing you should be able to go through this on your own. Okay, so this is distributed vertex programming. So what is the main idea here? The main idea is uh, you are working with the data that comes in naturally encoded as a graph, right? The vertices and, uh, and edges and vertices have properties and edges have properties and these are called property graphs, okay? I don't know, I don't know if Russians are attacking California or what's going on. What are they connected? Oh, great. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna run this, okay? Like, but it should all work. Um, so what is the first uh, basic idea is that there are, uh, so graph X, if you look in the source code is actually there in Spark, Spark core, but graph frames is a community package that does everything with data phase. So we often will use the community package. To use the community package, what we need is to load a library. I guess I should show you how to do this. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so then we need to launch the cluster. So give me a minute. So let's start a cluster. So if you're on your community edition, you should start a cluster. And then what I do generally is all the libraries I, I upload into my cluster. So you in case community, go to shared, okay? And then uh, uh, I generally put all the libraries here so that uh, it's clear what all the libraries are on the chart so people can attach and detach to different libraries. So now if you look here, there is graph frames 0.82, Spark 3.1, Scala 2.12, okay? So this is a particular graph frames uh, library that is there. So you're probably running a Spark 3, Scala 2.12 version. Um, so then you see there is a jar here and how did we get this jar here, right? So the way to do this is uh, uh, you go to, so if you wanna import a new library, because I already have this, so you can go create, uh, library, okay. So this library is available in uh, in Maven. So you can go because it's uh, 
Yeah. Uh, so let's see if I do uh, graph. Um, let me see. Search packages query. It's a bit slow, but I, usually you can save the string and paste this. I'm sort of showing you. So there are Spark packages and Maven Central. So Maven Central is a very, very big repository of a lot of uh, uh, um, jar files. And Spark packages is specifically for Spark. There you go, took a long time. And you see here there's graph frames, right? So this library is sort of community developed and it's there. There's a whole lot of things like Sparkin and graphs, GraphX, Sparkling Graph, whatever. But so then you need to make sure that you choose the right version, right? So there is, uh, so if you hover over it, the 0.82 Spark 2.4, Scala 2.11. Okay, that's if you're running a, 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 yeah, a, a lower version Spark cluster. Here is uh, the 3.0 Scala 2.12. So that's probably what you want, or maybe 0.8231. 3132. So you you know you, you have your default Spark cluster. It's probably 32 or 31. So you need to put the right uh, uh, choose the right one, and then you basically hit the select button. Oops, uh, you hit the select button, and then what will happen is this uh, this thing will load, and then you can simply do create. Okay, so then the library will get created. That's what I did. So you should try this in your community edition. So. And then what you will get something like this, and then you have to attach it to the cluster, right? So, so this is a good thing to do because it's really annoying and some things are counterintuitive. So this thing I've started. So if I go to my cluster and I go to libraries, okay? So currently there are no libraries and to wait for this to launch, uh, but then, um, maybe toward the end, I'll show you how the library loading works. Okay, so let's give it a minute. So while this is loading, let me quickly show you the, the basic idea of, of uh, vertex programming. So, so here is a little embed of GraphX, which is uh, unifying graphs and tables. And Yeah, so there are two main ways to parallelize. One is sort of data parallel, uh, and uh, this is what mainly we've been doing, right? With a whole bunch of rows. And then the other one is graph parallel. So if the data itself, you know, is, uh, is in a graph, then we somehow have to have to, have to exploit this, this uh, dependency structure in the graph when we do our partitioning. That's kind of the main idea. Wow. Why this is so so slow? Oh, sorry. So anyway, um, there are two main ways of cutting. So you can because the, the graph is too big, okay, and you have to somehow cut it and put it into different partitions. That's the idea. So what you always want to do is minimize communication costs. So you want uh, you want um, very few vertices. So you can do a vertex cut. Uh, that's generally yeah. This is. So you can take a vertex and then kind of cut around it. And then this stuff you can throw in one partition, this stuff you can throw in another, and this stuff you can throw in another, right? So the idea is that there is a lot more nodes here and all of them will fit into a partition. So the, the primitive operation in, in vertex programming is the following. It's uh, this um, Google paper, uh, it's um, uh, called bulk synchronous parallel processing. So the main idea is that every vertex will communicate to all its out neighbors. Every vertex will have a state, initial condition, and then it will communicate the state to all its out neighbors, and then the out neighbors you know, will receive the state, right? They want transmits, receives, and then with the message they receive, they will update their state, and then they will transmit their updated state. And then this continues until some, some stopping condition is reached, right? It's super simple. So there's only local you know, communication between neighbors. And uh, surprisingly, quite a lot of uh, problems can be solved in this, uh, in this framework, right? Uh, so these are some, yeah, some more explicit, uh, you know, how do you represent this as a vertex table and an edge table? 
but the basic idea is that um, um, you know we partition the graph. Right? So let's see what happened here. Let's quickly look at the libraries uh, here. Uh, let me go here again. So libraries. Okay, so there's uh, nothing installed. So if you brought, if you already uploaded your, how do you do this? Uh, shared, and then say graph frames. So you can go to the library and then you can say uh, install in this cluster, right? That's it. Um, so it'll take a while and then it's installed. And then when it's installed, you have to detach and reattach your notebook. So it will pick the jar that you attached. So these are the tiny little GUI hops <laughs> to do. But then that entire uh, library is at your disposal. Okay, so that's what uh, we will do. Okay, it's already installed. So now let's go to recents and grab this guy. So, um, Da, 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 da. Just, uh, I'm so sorry. I don't know why it's so slow. Okay. Um, so then you go here and say detach and reattach. Okay. Detach the notebook and reattach the notebook. Okay. So now the library should be available for you. Wow. How is the community? Is anyone running things on community edition? How is the traffic there? Okay. All right, three, one, one. So then, this is it, we import graph frames like that, right? And also some other things. So no errors, all good to go. So this is how you create graph frames. So you have some simple example and um, you can sort of SQL context, create data frame, give it a list or a seek, and then turn to a data frame ID, name, age. So this is, uh, the vertices, right? So this is, uh, these are the properties of the vertices. Uh, and then there is an edge data frame, which basically says who's connected to who and what that edge property is, right? So fan fall over. This can become arbitrarily complicated, right? Um, but that's a property graph. And then you can simply convert it to a graph frame by simply calling graph frames V E. So you just give the, the vertex data frame, the edge data frame, and then it does, uh, does this sort of stuff for you. Um, we, can, we can just sort of play around and do this little um, BT thing um, and sort of visualize quickly things. So yeah, so I now just did a lip one L. So this is one long literal, right? Just one, 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 and then and set this as a count. So this is a convenient thing to have. Um, yeah. So this is a quick visualizing it. Uh, so the, this example graph is also available from examples.graph.friends, one of the tiny examples that comes with Spark. So you can also do it like this. So I won't, uh, execute every cell, the traffic is too slow. Um, let me just quickly uh, show you what the basic uh, queries are, right? So you can ask, you can take a graph, G, and find out what its vertices are, find out what its uh, edges are, and um, you can ask what are the in degrees, the out degrees, and degrees, then this is treated as a directed graph, and, and all of this will happen completely at scale, right? So it's also the example. So you can do various things like group by minimum age, find the youngest person and do 
you know, pure SQL on top of, of this data frame, right? So that's the, that's the idea. Um, so you can say filter relationship as follows and count, that's the number of followers. This I would really like you to calmly go through. <laughs> this is very powerful. It's called motif finding. Uh, and Kieran, like this is kind of where I was trying to push you when you were. So Kieran was doing his master's with me and did some topological statistical. What did he do? So he took the wrap brain column and built the graph and he was studying various topological statistics of random graph models of the wrap brain. And uh, I guess we never needed a, a big data system because the rat's brain is not that big, right? Yeah. So, so anyway, I mean, I think uh, some of the some of the topological statistics I think are amenable to motif finding operations, right? This is a. I mean, that's a that would be an interesting problem to solve. So, can you use motif finding to find actually some of these topological statistics, and then. Uh, Maybe the KTH guys will, will give you a job. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so motifs are essentially, you know, you, you, you search for pairs of vertices with edges in both directions, for example. So you would say, you know, this is a node, this is a node, this is an edge. So you sort of code the pattern like this and you can basically have a very large graph and find, you know, things that go from A to B and from B to A, okay? And you can essentially list them and, um, yeah, so you, you want to kind of play around with this. Um, yeah, you can then take the motifs, which are basically subgraph patterns, and then do SQL on top of it on the properties, right? So this is uh, quite useful. I, stateful queries are very powerful. So you can actually have a state that you update as you traverse the motif. I mean, this is super powerful, right? So you can do quite a lot of things. Um, so, yeah, I think. You, you, yeah, so now you're using a little bit of Scala, like fold left. Uh, so if you're going through a sequence, you're doing some fold left. So you can have a state, the state gets updated as you're traversing and looking at some specific motifs and then updating the state based on some properties as you traverse, right? So you can sort of see this, this is, uh, what else? Uh, yeah, so you can also look at, um, subgraphs like this so you can filter and create subgraphs and uh, so this is a more complex triplet filter uh, yes this is what i wanted to do in a couple minutes so what i what i so there is a, a, a programming framework that graph x which is the rdd layer underneath graph frames implements uh which is uh you know this message passing thing, right? It's called a Pregel program, the way it implements it. So all these different algorithms, breadth first search on arbitrary large graph, finding the number of connected components and which connected component each node falls in, uh, strongly connected components for directed graphs, label propagation algorithm, say this is a, a simple way to detect communities, uh, or page rank, which is essentially the stationary distribution of a Markov chain, some uh, uniform mixing, uh, Google's page rank, and and uh, shortest paths. So if you have a bunch of landmark vertices and a lot of vertices, you can ask what is the shortest path from every vertex to these landmarks. So all of these are actually Pregel programs. All you need to do is to communicate some state to the out neighbors and then update from what you receive and then look at some termination condition, right? Triangle counts and so on. Uh, yeah. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, so Kieran, like the question is, can you can how many topological stats can you do <laughs> with, with the Pregel program? Right. I, I have no idea. Uh, yeah. Don't waste too much time on it. You know, I can't pay you, <laughs> but it's a fun project. I think it's a as far as I know, it's a challenge, right? Because uh, Martina and uh, White Tech at KTH topological data analysis group. I don't know if that's. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can, you know, yeah. I mean, also you can join with, you know, yeah, do, do whatever you want. But I'm just saying it, it's not clear whether 
whether it's Pregel programmable, like the, what topological statistics are Pregel programmable, what aren't, uh, it's not clear. Okay, so um, what else? Yeah, so I mean, I think I'm just giving you a lot of examples here. Uh, connected components, uh, if you're rusty, you can quickly look in all these Wikipedia embeds. So go through this slowly, uh, understand all these syntax, and all of them are basically uh, out of the box in graph frames and graph X, so you can just play with it directly. So for example, we have a study where we've been looking at like all of Swedish Twitterverse for nine months in 2018, depending on what you want to do this summer, we could study, set up another study and collect all the tweets for Sweden for a few months. And then we just do simple label propagation, things like this to detect politically uh, active communities based on the retweet signals only, right? So if somebody retweets somebody many times and you can make a weighted network and then, and, you know, strong patterns emerge. So it's, um, it's um, okay, so label propagation, um, Table propagation, yeah, you, you can look at it. Basically, every 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 node initially gets a unique ID, and then you propagate the broadcast your label. Say I'm one, two, three, four, and we are all connected somehow. And I say I'm one, and then I tell my out neighbors, and then and then I will receive like integers labels from all my in neighbors, and then I will take simply the mode. Yeah, I'll take the most frequent number I get, and then I will use that to update my state. We'll pick uniformly at random if they're all equally uh, frequent. And then that becomes my new label, right? And then I will propagate that uh, next time. And you keep doing this until, until some stopping condition, until let's say the labels don't change or so many times. Then what will happen is uh, the total number of distinct labels will reduce to just a few labels. And those you call the communities, right? It's super heuristic, super fast, but if the data is structured, it's a uh, first thing you do typically, right? Um, so page rank is there. Uh, once again, you can play with this. Uh, so we, we, for example, on another project with some students, uh, we've done the page rank algorithm for all of Lithuania, uh, which is kind of cool. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but this is the road network, right? So you can actually turn the road network into a graph and then actually do say page rank. And then what it means actually intuitively is that uh, road segments that have a lot of paths coming into it, so probably some big cities and so on, will actually have a high value, right? So it's interpretable in traffic situation as well. So you could do this. Shortest paths is good. I already told you, so a bunch of landmarks, uh, triangle counts. So just play with this. And here, I think I've sort of given you a baby Pregel program, right? So here's something, how do you, how do you use sort of aggregate messages and uh, send to source and send to destination? Uh, this is sort of a baby Pregel program to get you initiated. And what I want to point out is that if you want to do any kind of graphical model inference, the Pregel programs, uh, they call them belief propagations. So you can actually do do belief propagation with Pregel programs. And so you can do like graphical model inference if you want at scale. Um, you can do simulations and so on. So anyway, there's some project ideas here. Uh, I think this one is trying to show you what's really going on in a graph frames example. So I think I just made a package cell for you by just copy pasting directly from this belief propagation. So if you wanna sort of get into this and because we have some chemists maybe, if you wanna do simulation at scale, like Ising model and so on, you can sort of see how the default belief propagation implementation is and, and um, yeah, sort of play around with this. Um, okay, so what I would recommend you do, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. So the next notebook is really, really good. It's about some real uh, use case on, on time flight performance. So please uh, check this out. Uh, it's exactly the same things, but now we actually have some interesting data on, on flights moving from airports and so it's okay. Something you typically will do to, yeah, to, to get some kind of insights from, okay. Uh, we will stop there now. And then this one is just continuing with the power plant pipeline. Um, and yeah, so here we are just um, 
going to do the deployment. So one thing here I wanted to point out is uh, to properly understand deployment, we need to know a little bit about uh, Spark streaming, but I kind of, you can abstract away, um, you know, so you can basically, so what I've basically done is try to, try to set up a, a, a stream of, a, you know, queries coming at you and then this model that you've trained and, and written to file under some format, so PNML format, you can read the learned model from file and then simply you know, show that to the stream and so everything comes in, it'll predict, right? It's just a baby way of like showcasing it, right? But in, in, in proper deployment, you, you, you do more sophisticated things. So that kind of brings us to sort of the end of uh, module one, okay? So um, this will take, I don't know, six hours at least to go through slowly. So, uh, I'll stop now. Um.